So now in order to take a look at a different type of sequence or different type of series, we're going to need to develop some new terminology here. So we're going to be working on counting principles, how to count the total number of outcomes or options for something or for multiple events. So for example, if you are going out to dinner and the restaurant has a deal where you choose an appetizer, an entree, and dessert. You have two choices for appetizer, super salad, three choices for entrees, chicken, fish, or steak, and then two choices for dessert, cake, or pudding. So let's take a look at a tree of all the different options that we have. So branching off on our first choice, there's two options or two choices for the appetizer. We can choose soup or we can choose salad. And then from, say, the universe where we choose soup, we can either choose chicken, fish, or steak. So we have three options there if we choose soup. And then also if we choose salad, we have those same three options, chicken, fish, or steak. And then from each of those, so, so far we can take a look. We had two options for appetizer. And then for entree, we had three options. So we could either do soup or chicken, soup or fish or salad and chicken, salad and steak. So right now at this point, we have six options or six choices. And those different choices, like I said, are soup, chicken, soup, fish, soup, steak, salad, chicken, salad, fish, salad, steak. And then from each of those six options, we now have two options for dessert, cake or pudding. I'm just gonna abbreviate those C and P. So cake or pudding if we choose chicken, cake or pudding if we choose fish, cake or pudding, if we choose steak, and then same thing for the salad side. It's all cake or pudding as these options. So now we can see how many choices we actually have in total. So for example, one choice would be soup, chicken, cake, or soup, chicken, pudding, or soup, fish, cake, soup, fish, pudding. So we have all these options. Essentially, we're just following the paths all the way down. So if you count all the end branches here, there are 12 total meal combinations that we can create. And we can think about how many combinations we would have if we didn't have the option of the appetizer, if we were just choosing between entree and dessert. So essentially what that means is we're just cutting this diagram in half. We're taking away the first choice, the soup or salad. So then all we really have are the entree and dessert choices. And so from those, we're really just looking at one half of the options that we have. So this is six. And we can think about this in terms of multiplication, because what's happening here is you have two choices for appetizer. From each of those two choices, you're adding three. So you're adding three twice, which is three times two. And then from each of those six choices, you're adding two choices onto each of those. So that's six times two. So we're doing multiplication here to figure out the total number of meal combinations. So 12 comes from the two choices for appetizers times the three choices for entrees times the two choices for dessert. And then same thing here. This is coming from the three choices for the entree times the three choices for dessert. Or you can just take the 12 and we're kind of dividing it by two. And so this is the foundational counting principle where if you have M options for one situation and N options for another, there are M times N total options for both. And then if you have three situations with M, N, and P total options for each, then the total options for all of the situations together is M times N times P and so on and so on. It's just all multiplication when you look at the different options. So taking a look at an example, we can be making license plates. So let's say if we're making license plates, we have, so we have the license plate has six digits. The first three digits are going to be letters. The second three are going to be numbers. And we're saying the letter O cannot be used because it looks too much like a zero. So let's take a look at how we figure out how many total license plates we can make. The first situation is where the letters and numbers can repeat. So we have six spots to fill on this license plate. So let's draw spaces for the license plate. So we have six spaces, six spots. The first three 
our letters minus O. We can't use O. And so the number of options that we have for the first spot, well, there's 26 letters in the alphabet. Take away O, so there's 25 options that we have. And because we can repeat letters, we can use that same one that we just chose. So that means we still have 25 options for the second spot and 25 options for the third spot. And then for the next set of three, these are numbers. And we say numbers, it's the digits. We, we can't put like 27 as a number. And you might be thinking, okay, well, there's nine options. Well, we can also use zero. So it's the digits zero through nine. So that means there's 10 options for the first one, and we can repeat. So there's 10 options for the next one and 10 options for that last one. Any of the digits zero through nine. And so what we do with all of these choices for each of the spots is we multiply. It's like in the previous example, we made a tree. We could make a tree here. It would just be a massive tree. The first level would have 25 branches. And then for each of those bran 25 branches, you would have 25 more branches and then 25 more branches. And it just keeps going and going. And so if you punch this into the calculator, what you come out with is 15,625,000 license plates. So there are a lot of options for license plates. And that's even with a lot of restrictions here. In reality, there's not as many restrictions. And so let's take a look at a very similar situation, but the difference is that the letters and numbers cannot repeat. So still license plates, but letters and numbers cannot repeat. So taking a look at this, we have six spots or six spaces still. So let's draw all those out. And the first three again are letters. And the second set of three are numbers. And now we have the same number of options or choices for the first one. There's 25 choices because we can't use the letter O. And then for the next one, it doesn't matter what we pick for the first one, but whatever we pick, we cannot pick again. So that means we have one less option for the next one. So that's 24. And then one less option for the one after that, that's 23. And then for the numbers, we have 10 options or 10 choices for that first digit. And then no matter what we choose, we can't choose it again. So then there's one less option for the next one, that's nine, and then one less choice for the last one. And we still multiply all these together. And so when we multiply all these together, we get 9,936,000 license plate options. And for the next one here, we're taking a look at how many phone numbers per area code. So this is kind of an important part here, the per area code. So thinking about those first three digits, whether it's 928, 480, 602, whatever it is, that per area code. So we are excluding the first three digits of the phone number. So if you're thinking about how many digits are in your phone number, you might be saying your number in your head and counting. There should be seven digits for the remaining digits of the phone number. So we have seven spots or seven spaces here. And in the first space, we can't use zero, eight, or nine. So that means that we normally would have 10 options or 10 choices, but for the first one, we have seven. And for the next one, since we can repeat digits, we can use 10 options for the next one, 10 choices for the next, 10 choices for the next. The rest of these are all 10 choices. And so what we do is we multiply all these together. And before you get out your calculator, we can do this without a calculator. And in fact, let's write this in scientific notation. So this is seven times 10. Count how many times we, tens we have. There are six tens. So this is seven times 10 to the six, which is seven. And then just write six zeros, which in fact is seven million different numbers. And for the next one, we're looking at how many computer passwords are possible if the passwords must have four letters and can repeat letters. So not a very secure password, only four letters, and we're only using letters. We're not using any symbols or numbers or capital letters. So the number of spots or the number of spaces we have here is one, two, three, four spots. And in the first one, we can use any letter. So there's 26 options because there's 26 letters. The next one we can repeat. So there's 26 options here. 26 options here and 26 options here. So this is 26 to the fourth power, or we can write it as 456,000 
976 different passwords. So the next one here is looking at how many computer passwords are possible if the password must be four characters long. So same situation. And the characters can be letters, numbers, or one of the 11 symbols on the top row of the keyboard. The total number of options that we have here, let's think about that. So we can do letters, so there's 26 letters. We can do numbers, so there's 10 numbers. And we can do any of those 11 symbols, like the exclamation point, the percent, the star, pound, all that we can use. And so this would be 11. So add these together, there's 47 options for each spot. So the total number of spots that we have is four. So we have one, two, three, four spots. And then there's 47 options in the first one times 47 choices in this next one times 47 choices in the third times 47 choices in the fourth. So this is 47 to the fourth power, which ends up being 4,879,681 passwords. So now let's take a look at a situation where we actually use up all of our choices. So if we are, say, a baseball coach and we are creating a batting lineup. So if you're not familiar, a batting lineup means you're just ordering the players on who gets to bat first. And you have to go through the entire list of players before anyone else can bat. So you can't repeat players in the batting order or in the batting lineup. So looking at this, we have nine players to choose from, and we want to list them or create a batting lineup for these players. And we'll see how many lineups are possible. So first off, the number of spots that we have is nine. We have one, two, three, four. We have nine spots because we have nine batters. And in the first spot, we have nine choices. We haven't picked anyone, so we can choose anyone. In the next spot, we can't choose whoever we chose first. So we have eight choices there. And then now we've already chosen two. So that means we have seven choices left. And then we've already chosen three, so we have six. And it just keeps decreasing by one each time until we get all the way down to one. And then we multiply all these. Nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. And when you put this in the calculator, you should get 362,880 lineups. And now this type of multiplication comes up so often in math that we actually give it a special name and it's in many calculators. And in fact, it is in Desmos. So instead of having to type nine times eight times seven all the way down to one, you can just punch in a couple buttons into the Desmos calculator and into most scientific calculators and it will do this calculation for you. This calculation, what it's called is, it's called a factorial. So it's written as N with an exclamation point. I know it seems weird. So like this one here would be N with an exclamation point. And so what this means and when we use it is if we have N number of objects or N items in a set and we're arranging all N of them in order, then the number of different orders is n factorial. So looking at this in Desmos, we have, so in Desmos, we want to do nine factorial. So we just hit the number nine. And then we go to the tab right here where it says func, F-U-N-C, stands for function. And then at the bottom here on the left, we have the exclamation point. You can also, if you're on a computer or have a keyboard, you can just type the exclamation point on your keyboard. I don't have a keyboard on this tablet, so I just go to the function and exclamation point, and it calculates that 362,880, which is the same thing as if you do nine times eight times seven times six times five, all the way down to one. And so this is a much quicker and nicer way of doing these multiplications. So let's look at a similar scenario where we're still making a batting lineup, but we have 12 players to pick from, which means there's gonna be three players that have to sit out. So we still have nine spots on our batting order or batting lineup. And so for the first choice, the first spot, we have 12 choices because there's 12 players to pick from. And the next one, we can't pick the same players. So we have one less choice. There's 11 choices. And then we have one less choice than the previous, which is 10. And this counts down all the way, eight, seven, six, five to four. And so what we do with all these numbers is we multiply them. 
So if you throw this in the calculator, you get 79,833,600 lineups. And you might be wondering, well, he just told us this great way of doing these multiplications with the factorial, but this isn't even a factorial because we don't go all the way down to one. And so that's what this next question is asking, actually, is how is this different than 12 factorial, or why can't we do 12 factorial? If you think about why we can't do 12 factorial, is because 12 factorial means you go all the way down to 1. So we're missing the 3 times 2 times 1. So if we had 3 times 2 times 1 there, we could do 12 factorial. But in fact, if you think about what 3 times 2 times 1 is, 3 times 2 times 1 is actually 3 factorial. So this thing, the operation that we just did is missing 3 factorial if we were to do 12 factorial. So this here, think about what it means to take away from multiplication. So we, if we had 12 factorial, this would be listed down all the way to 1, all multiplication. So that means we removed the 3 factorial. To remove or to take away from multiplication, you divide. So this thing, this product that we just did, is actually the same thing as if we were to do 12 factorial divided by 3 factorial. And this 3 factorial is actually the leftover amount. It's the number of players that we didn't choose. It's the number of batters that had to sit out. And so this is actually the 12 minus 9. It's the difference between how many players we had versus how many spots that we had. And this also comes up so often in math that we give it its own name. This is called a permutation. So a permutation is if we have n total items to put into r spots. So if we're arranging r out of the n total, and the order matters, and that's the important part here is that the order matters. So the way we write that is we write it as n P R. So this is like thinking back to the subscripts with like the a, a subscript one, a subscript two, with the sequences and series. This subscript is on the N and the R. These are subscripts and the P is the, the big regular print. And so the formula for this, it's in the numerator, it's N factorial. So it's like saying, well, you if you were to order everything, that's how many options you have. But you can't order everything. You have to divide out the difference. So we're dividing out the n minus r factorial. And we can actually do this in Desmos. So in Desmos, there's a button that looks like n, p, r. And then it has, it creates a parenthesis here. And then you just enter the n and the r. And so that's how we do it in Desmos. We'll take a look at that. So if we want to think of this previous example in terms of the permutations with the n and the r, the n is the total number of items that we have to choose from, which is 12, and the r is the total number of spots or slots that we're putting them in, which is the 9. So if we're putting this into Desmos, this is 12p9, which in Desmos is the npr and then we type in 12 comma 9. So let's see that in Desmos. So in Desmos here, if we are in the main tab, we go over to the function tab and we do NPR, that's over in the very bottom left, and then we go back to the main and we type the 12 comma, the commas to the left of the zero, 9. And we actually get, close the parenthesis, the 79,833,600. So it's the same number as if we were to do the 12 factorial divided by the 3 factorial, which is the same thing as if we were to do 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 all the way down to 4. So all these different ways of getting that same number. The quickest way is using the NPR function in the calculator. So I've been emphasizing here that the order matters. So if we're taking n items and putting them to r spots where the order of the items matter, we use a permutation. But there are situations where the order wouldn't matter. So like in a batting lineup, the order is important. If you have something like ABC, that's different than BCA. 
because it changes the outcome. Someone else bats first versus second versus third. But if you're making a committee, for example, like for work, it's saying, hey, you three people go work on this project or go work on this job, creating a committee for something. That order that you choose the committee doesn't matter. You're all working together. So that's a case where the order wouldn't matter. However, the order could matter if you're assigning a committee or assigning a project and saying, hey, Patrick, you are the lead of the committee. Jennifer, you are the recorder of the committee and so on. You're assigning roles to people. Then the order does matter that you choose the people in the committee because you're giving roles. And so Patrick being the recorder and Jennifer being the lead of the committee is different than switching the roles around. And it, another example of where the order doesn't matter if you're playing card games like Go Fish or Blackjack or anything like that, the order of the cards in your hand does not ever matter. It just matters what the cards are. So if the order does not matter, then we call this a combination. So taking a look at an example of this, let's say we're making a committee. So if we have a committee of two people that we're making, but we have five choices. So we're choosing two out of five. If we were assigning roles, like for example, president and vice president, saying person A is the president and person B is the vice president is a different outcome than saying person B is the president and person A is the vice president. So if the order matters here, if you count how many options we have, there are 20 choices here. Or there's 20 different committees. But if the order does not matter, if you're saying, hey, you two people go work on this job, or you two people go work on this project. If you choose A, B, that's the same as choosing B, A. They're both working on the committee. It doesn't matter the order that you choose them. And same thing, if you choose A, C, that gets rid of, it's the same thing as C, A. And we can continue to do this. Choosing A, D is the same as D, A. A, E is the same as E, A. So if you just follow along, we can actually eliminate a lot of the options here. And in fact, if you count, there are 10 choices, which means we cut this in half. And so really what we're doing is we're looking at, well, how many different ways are there to rearrange, you know, the same two people? Well, there's only two ways to rearrange that. So we're dividing by two. So we're chopping in half. So this is what's called the combination rule because this happens so much in math. It's a button in the calculator and it's a formula. And so with the combinations, this is NCR, which is equal to N factorial over N minus R factorial. So it's the same thing as the permutation, but we divide by the size of the group that we're choosing, which is R factorial. So if we are choosing R items from n total when the order does not matter like choosing a committee then we get the total number of options with the combination here which we can also see this written as n r like this with parentheses around it sort of stacked so we can see it written in both of these ways and in desmos This is also a button in Desmos. We would just do, there's a button that says NCR and we input in the parentheses, the N and the R. So in this scenario, the N would be the total number of things we can choose from. So that's five people, the A, B, C, D, E. And then the R is the size or how many people we're choosing. So that is two. So the question is, like, when do you use these formulas? And the important part is if the order matters versus if the order does not matter. So if the order matters, we use a permutation. If the order does not matter, we use a combination. And so we can see a few examples. First off, we can see how many ways are there to pick three astronauts to go to the moon out of 10 candidates. So here, it doesn't matter the order so there's no order, which means we're using a combination. And so here the N is the total number of choices we have, the total 
size of the group that we're picking from, so that's 10. And then R is the number of people, or the number of things that we're picking, so that's three. So writing this out, this is 10 C three, or again, we can write that as 10 three, which will end up being, let's see that in Desmos. So we have under the function tab, NCR, and we go back to the main and we're doing 10 comma three. So we see that's 120 options. And then the other scenarios, we still have 10 people to choose from and we're choosing three people to go to the moon, but we're choosing one person to be a captain, one person being a navigator, and one person being the science officer. So who we assign these roles to does matter. We can take three people and assign them different roles and those are all different outcomes. So the order does matter here. So that means we're using a permutation. And it's still n is 10 and r is 3 because we're choosing from 10 people. That's how many we have to choose from. And then we're actually choosing three of them. So we write this as 10 p3. There's not a fancy extra way of writing the permutation. And so when we put this in Desmos, going over to the function tab in the bottom left, that's npr. And then we type 10 comma 3, close the parentheses, and that's 720. Now let's say we have 12 runners in a race and we are seeing first off how many different orders could all 12 runners finish. In this one, of course, the order matters. Someone finishing first is different than some, someone finishing second or third or fourth. And so the order matters here. So we're using a permutation where the N is 12 and the R is also 12. So doing this with 12 P 12, if you throw that into Desmos, you get 479,000,600. And then this next one here is that prices are given for first, second, and third places. You want to see how many different orders are there for the top three places. So here, again, the order matters because think of it as giving gold, silver, and bronze medals. It matters the three people that we choose to be in the first, second, or third. We can rearrange three people in those different ways because someone could get first or gold, which is a different outcome than that person getting silver or second. So the order matters here. So we're doing a permutation where the N is 12 and the R is three. So we have 12 P three, throw that into Desmos. That's 1,320 options that we have. And the last one here is that the, three runners are being chosen for drug testing. And so this means that the order does not matter because it, it doesn't matter the order that you choose the three runners, they're all getting drug tested. The result is the same. So there's no order here. So we're using a combination. So for the combination, this is N is 12 and the R is three because we have 12 people to choose from and we're choosing three of them. So I'd put this 12 C three, which we can also write as 12 three in the parentheses and put this into Desmos. This is 220 options.